So here we have a simple Python reverse shell command running in one terminal. And on the other terminal, I'm listening for a connection using netcat on port 4443. When I execute this one-liner reverse shell command, we get a connection back on the listening terminal. Pretty simple, right? But have you ever wondered how it actually works? Today, you're going to find out. I've opened the Python reverse shell command in my Sublime text editor and broken it down into parts for better understanding. By the way, if you're new here, make sure to subscribe to the channel and like this video because I regularly post content like this. Anyway, if you carefully look at the start of the command, you'll notice we're specifying our interpreter, which is Python 3. Remember, Python doesn't use a compiler, it runs with an interpreter. There's a big difference between a compiler and an interpreter, and you can quickly Google it if you're curious. So, Python allows us to execute code passed as a string directly from the command line without needing to save it in a file. The dash C flag is used for this purpose. It tells the Python interpreter to execute the following string as Python code. Next comes our code string. Anything between these quotes is treated as a string. Inside this string, we have our Python code. The code starts by importing a few Python modules. Each module has functions that perform specific tasks. The first module is the socket module, which is used for networking. It's actually responsible for creating a connection between the two machines, and we'll use it to establish a TCP connection. Next is the subprocess module, which is typically used for running system commands. However, in this particular code, it isn't used at all, so it can be removed. I'm not sure why it was even included. Then we have the OS module, which is used to manipulate file descriptors like input, output, and errors. It's also responsible for spawning a shell. After this comes the most important part, where we use the socket module to make the connection. If you look carefully at the first line, we create a new variable called s and use it as a socket object. The interesting part lies in the socket function. We provide it with two parameters. The first parameter tells it that we're going to use IP version 4, and the second one specifies that we want to make a TCP-based connection. This entire socket setup is assigned to the variable s. In the next line, we specify the IP address and port, which tells the socket to connect to that specific destination. For a successful connection, the attacker must be actively listening on the given IP and port, Otherwise, it won't work. Once the connection is established, it acts like a remote tunnel to the attacker's machine. Okay, so the next three lines, these are the key parts of this reverse shell. So look carefully and try to understand what's happening. If you closely observe these three lines, there's one parameter common in all of them. This one, it gets the file descriptor. Basically, in Linux, everything is treated as a file, even network connections, terminal input, dot output, etc. Each file is assigned a number called a file descriptor, like 0 for standard input, 1 for standard output, and 2 for standard error. These three are automatically opened when a program starts. Let's understand this with an example. So, imagine you're a computer. You normally read commands from the keyboard, that's standard input, and its file descriptor is 0. You write results to the screen, that's standard output, with file descriptor 1. You also show error messages, that's standard error with file descriptor 2. But if a hacker wants to control you remotely, they want their network connection to act like your keyboard and screen. So this parameter basically gives you the file descriptor number of that socket. If you look at this DUP2, it stands for duplicate file descriptor. It takes two parameters. Look at the line I've written at the bottom of the file. That's just to help you understand how the DUP2 function works. This function comes from the OS module and takes two arguments. The first is the old file descriptor, and the second is the new one. What it does is redirect data from the old file descriptor to the new one. In simple terms, it overwrites the new file descriptor to receive input or output from the source of the old one. Now let's go through these three lines one by one. The first line redirects standard input to come from the socket. The second line redirects standard output to go to the socket and the third line redirects standard error to the socket as well. Without these redirections, you would spawn a shell, but it would still try to communicate with the local terminal instead of the attackers. This is a slightly low-level concept, but hopefully it makes sense. In the next line, 
we import another module called PTY. It's a Python module used to spawn pseudo-terminals. Its spawn function starts a new bash shell inside a pseudo-terminal, which makes the shell behave more like a real terminal. Without it, the shell might not be interactive or could behave unexpectedly. So that was a brief explanation of a simple Python reverse shell. I personally believe in fully understanding how things work instead of just running them blindly. By the way, if you're interested in learning hacking, make sure to check out our guide through the link in the description. I've gathered all the essential beginner resources into one place to help you get started quickly without wasting your time. It's the first link in the description, so definitely check it out. Subscribe to the channel and I'll see you in the next video.